And did they think they had a chance? Listen. When war comes between Japan and the United States, I shall not be content merely to occupy Guam, the Philippines, Hawaii, and San Francisco. I look forward to dictating the peace to the United States in the White House at Washington. Yamamoto wrote those words on January of 1941. Yes, the conquering Jap army down Pennsylvania Avenue. That was the final goal. You will see what they did to the men and women of Nanking, Hong Kong, and Manila. Imagine the field day they'd enjoy if they'd march through the streets of Washington. But before striking, a preliminary step was necessary. From Berlin, from Rome, from Tokyo, the campaign started. Propaganda to confuse, divide, soften up their intended victims. Put them on the defensive. Scream you're abused. Shout you're oppressed. The world's wrong. You're right. If you shriek it loud enough and often enough, they'll believe you. Above all, use their free press and their free speech to destroy them. Lebensraum, yeah, Lebensraum, meine Volksgenossen. Lebensraum, they demanded. Living room. Our lands are overcrowded. But at the same time, they gave prizes to mothers who bore the most sons. They brought together large groups of young men and young girls for human breeding. Read what one of their leaders wrote. Of course, the children from this assembly line belong to the state to be scientifically trained for conquest. Another how was the lack of raw material. They claimed they were the have nots and we were the haves. But out of this supposed lack, they built up the greatest war machines the world has ever known. These are the published figures from the German military budget. Actually, between 1933 and 1939, Hitler's program of rearmament cost more than $80 billion. The Nazis alone assembled a striking force of 30 panzer divisions, 70 motorized divisions, 140 infantry divisions, plus the Luftwaffe, the world's largest air force. And they had no raw materials. Think of the bread, the automobiles, the good things of life that the German, Italian, Japanese leaders might have given their people if they had spent this money for peace instead of war. You know what billions we are now spending to match their military force? No. No, these arguments were all smoke screens. When war came, the democracies proved to be the have-nots, and our enemies, the haves. And when war came, where did it come? September 18th, 1931, a date we should remember as well as December 7, 1941. For on that date, in 1931, the war we are now fighting began. The place was Manchuria, the northernmost province of China, 6,000 miles from San Francisco. Manchuria, the first objective in the Tanaka Plan. By September 18th, the Japanese, who by treaty patrolled the Southern Manchurian Railway, had secretly and illegally increased their garrisons. On the Korean-Manchurian border, an entire Japanese army was assembled, conveniently equipped for a winter campaign. All they needed was an excuse. They made their own. 
At 10.30 that night, just after the Mukden Express had passed by, a section of track was dynamited, causing damage to one rail and two fish plates. Japan's honor had been violated. Within half an hour, the Japanese railroad garrison launched a coordinated attack on the barracks of the sleeping Chinese army at Mukden. The slaughter was appalling. By midnight, the conveniently placed Japanese army poured across the Korean border, and the first open act of aggression, the invasion of Manchuria, was on. In four days, they had occupied the whole of southern Manchuria, and shortly after, the whole country. Manchuria became Manchukuo, a puppet state with an obedient stooge on the throne, Henry Puyi, a weakling whom the Japanese had prepared for the job with seven years of women and song. In Washington, Henry L. Stimson, then Secretary of State, now Secretary of War, sent out a blistering denunciation of the attack. The League of Nations sent a committee of five, headed by Lord Lytton and including our own General Frank McCoy to Manchuria to investigate. In October of 1932, the committee issued its report. We found that the Japanese occupation of this large part of China was not justified on the ground of self-defense, and that the new state which had been set up was a Japanese protectorate rather than a genuine case of Manchurian self-determination. Shortly after, the League condemned Japan as an aggressor nation. I call on His Excellency, Monsieur Matsuoka, delegate of Japan. It is a matter of common knowledge that Japan's policy is fundamentally inspired by a genuine desire to guarantee peace in the Far East and to contribute to the maintenance of peace throughout the world. Japan, however, finds it impossible to accept the report adopted by the assembly. In answer, the Japanese delegates, knowing there were no guns behind this condemnation, smiled, took up their briefcases, marched out of the league. More than Manchuria was dead. Collective security was dead. A green light had been given the aggressors. We and the rest of the world knew that these aggressors should be stopped and punished, but we were unwilling to make the necessary sacrifices to back up that opinion. It was impossible to convince a farm boy in Iowa, or a driver of a London bus, or a waiter in a Paris cafe that he should go to war because of a mud hut in Manchuria. Yet the subsequent course of history makes it clear that that incident, so many miles away, is one of the main reasons that you and millions of others are in uniform today.